Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the statutory and regulatory requirements anticipating expectations within a quality management system or ISO 9001 audit. My name is Joseph Krolikowski and I am the QMS program manager for Perry Johnson Registrars. A couple of notes for all of you. Uh, all of our participants today are on mute, uh, but we absolutely want to take your questions. So please utilize the question portion of the dashboard. We will address your questions at the end of the presentation. One of the more common questions that we get is whether or not the presentation will be available after we're finished. Uh, the answer to that is yes. Uh, we do this in two ways. Uh, one, we do make the slides available. Uh, right on our website, you'll be able to download them. And if you'd like to rewatch the video with the voiceover, that can also be done on our YouTube page. Uh, and there's a link for that also on the PGR website under previously recorded webinars. Our topics for today, we're going to start with kind of a um, textbook review of what statutory and regulatory requirements are. We're going to explore a bit about why PJR is including statutory and regulatory requirements within an ISO 9001 audit. We'll highlight the areas in ISO 9001 itself uh, where statutory and regulatory requirements are mentioned. Uh, a couple of practical examples uh, for you on how this might manifest within an audit. Uh, a few concluding remarks and then your questions. Now, statutory and regulatory requirements are both uh, defined within the ISO 9000 document. This is, of course, the fundamentals and vocabulary document that's published by the ISO. Uh, a statutory requirement is defined as an obligatory requirement specified by a legislative body. A regulatory requirement is defined as, uh, again, an obligatory requirement, but this time specified by an authority uh, who is mandated by a legislative body. Now, the main difference between a statutory and regulatory requirement is going to be where that requirement is coming from. Uh, when you speak in terms of statutory requirements, you're speaking of statutes uh, or legal requirements uh, that come from legislative bodies. So this is going to be state and federal government level. <clears throat> A regulatory requirement is going to be derived from regulations. Um, so you might think of uh, the Environmental Protection Agency uh, or OSHA, uh, the FDA, the FCC, and so forth. These are uh, uh, going to be rules that are issued by an agency that has been empowered uh, by our government body, uh, empowered to regulate an industry uh, or uh, to accomplish something. And often um, these are going to be found within the Code of Federal Regulations or CFR. <clears throat> so, for example, the Food and Drug Administration has been statutorily authorized to regulate food and drug safety through the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Safety Act. Now, the specifics of those uh, regulations, uh, the specific labeling, the specific packaging requirements, uh, these are found in Title 21 of the CFR. Um, the regulations are issued by the FDA uh, in order to help them fulfill their statutory authority to regulate. So to kind of boil this down, think of statutes as the law. And in most cases, the, the legal verbiage is going to be very general. The regulations, the regulatory side of things, um, are going to be a lot more specific. Uh, they're going to be interpretations of the law. And often, they are going to provide parameters uh, in terms of staying within the law. So here's an example. Uh, a statute might say that you are not 
uh, permitted to have excessive levels of certain per pollutants within a major body of water. Now, that's subject to interpretation. So the EPA is tasked with issuing regulations on this verbiage. They're going to regulate well, what does excessive level mean? What is a major body of water? Um, and they will also issue uh, plans for enforcement uh, to make sure that these uh, uh, requirements are met. <clears throat> So how does all of this add up to an ISO 9001 audit? And, and why is PJR specifically uh, inquiring about these things? Well, uh, we are held accountable to a number of requirements in our work as a certification body. Uh, perhaps the most important of these is ISO 17021-1. Um, the 17021 standard you can kind of think of as ISO 9001 for a certification body. Uh, now that standard, it includes a clause that reads as follows. Uh, auditing shall include the client's management system ability and performance regarding the meeting of applicable statutory and regulatory requirements. So the short version is we are looking at these things because we are compelled to look at these things uh, by the folks that we answer to. Now, in terms of how statutory and regulatory requirements are present, uh, or at least mentioned, in ISO 9001 itself. There's actually six uh, distinct places, and I'm gonna highlight all of them for you here. In 512A, it stipulates that top management is responsible uh, for a lot of things, uh, but one of the things it's responsible for is ensuring that statutory and regulatory requirements are determined, are understood, and are consistently met. Uh, that's one of uh, many things that leadership or top management is responsible for. In 822A1, it states that statutory and regulatory requirements need to be a uh, part of what is determined by the organization during the contractual phase with the organization's customers. So when you're gathering all of the usual information, uh, what type of product are you asking us to make, what volume, does this product need to be produced at? Where does it need to be shipped? Uh, and so forth, all the usual things. Uh, you are also tasked with uncovering, uh, are there any applicable statutory or regulatory requirements in play for this particular product or service? Under A231D, kind of a similar requirement, uh, once you have determined what those statutory and regulatory requirements are, they need to be reviewed. Uh, you need to assess and make sure that quality management system um, is going to be able to fulfill all of those requirements, uh, whatever applicability there may be, uh, and that needs to be done uh, just like any other input requirement. Uh, they needs to be reviewed prior to your commitment to supplying a product or service uh, to the customer. Under 833C, uh, for organizations that are responsible uh, or a participant in the design process, it states that you need to include statutory and regulatory requirements among the design inputs. Under 842C1, it states that uh, the organization needs to ensure that any external providers that are being used or things purchased from external providers are not uh, affecting compliance to statutory and regulatory requirements. Um, and then under 855A, it states that uh, statutory and regulatory requirements need to be included in determining the extent of applicable post-delivery activities. So in other words, one very quick example of that, if there is a regulatory requirement that says the manufacturer of a particular type of product has to, uh, by law, uh, provide recycling services for that product. Well, that's a form of a regulatory requirement impacting uh, your post-delivery activities. So 
So in terms of how we have approached this requirement vis-a-vis uh, -vis the audit process, uh, we have put uh, two targeted questions in the ISO 9001-2015 audit report. Um, now these questions are very open-ended. Uh, they're intended to prompt uh, some discussion uh, with the auditee and an appropriate level of investigation. I'll be showing you what those questions look like in just a couple slides here. Now, in terms of common examples, things that we are seeing in multiple audits, uh, lots of clients. Uh, obviously, OSHA is very prevalent. Uh, this gets into things like PPE, ergonomics, providing safety training, and so forth. Uh, a lot of our clients, uh, especially here in the United States, fall under the ITAR, or International Traffic and Arms Regulations. Uh, this is going to manifest potentially in areas like controlled access uh, to either the facility, to records, or both. Um, safety data sheets, you may uh, still know these as MSDS. Uh, these requirements get into handling, use, disposal, et cetera, uh, typically of chemical-based products. So uh, product cleaners, product packaging materials, raw materials even. Uh, this is an area uh, that can have some impact depending on your business. So in terms of how the auditors are going to be investigating this, determining what is applicable, um, it's important to note that a lot of what we're already looking at in the audit process is going to help us determine what applies. Uh, we're already looking at the contracts you have with your customers. We're already looking at the purchase orders that your customers are issuing to you. Um, that's a very common place where statutory and regulatory requirements uh, could be mentioned. We're already looking at the blueprints uh, for the products and any related specifications. Uh, obviously, that's going to be uh, a potential source uh, for statutory and regulatory requirements. Uh, even websites, customer websites, uh, can include some clues on what is applicable uh, and needs to be verified. Now, one of the things that we've emphasized to our auditors uh, when we've uh, trained them on this topic is uh, this audit is intended to be uh, simply a confirmation that you, uh, the auditee, have an effective process in place for uh, identifying and complying with these requirements. And I'll remind you of the verbiage that's used in 17021 the management system ability and performance regarding the meeting of applicable statutory and regulatory requirements. Um, our job in the context of an ISO 9001 audit is to ensure that you have an effective process in place for identifying and implementing uh, what applies to you. Um, it's not our job to audit the specific line items therein. We're not there to be OSHA auditors or EPA auditors or so forth. Uh, our job is simply to make sure that you are uh, managing this in an effective manner um, uh, yourselves. So as promised, here are the two questions that have been built into our audit report. Uh, first, is there an effective process for identification of applicable statutory and regulatory requirements? That is simply a yes or no question. <clears throat> And then a little bit of a deeper question, are there any current projects or products that were observed during the audit where it was necessary uh, for the auditor to sample overall implementation or understanding of the applicable statutory or regulatory requirements? Please provide a summary. So I've uh, filled this in here with a little bit of example data. Uh, this particular company is ITAR regulated. Our auditor confirmed a sign-in protocol as well as locks on the cabinets. Uh, no ITAR regulated product in-house at today's audit, so kind of uh, a minimal amount of things to look at. And just for good measure, I threw in DFARS as well. Uh, this gets into domestic sourcing, so our auditor's appropriate note here, 
confirm that all suppliers used for raw materials and finishing services are domestic sources. Uh, this is an appropriate um, and satisfactory fulfillment of this assessment question. Now, obviously, you're wondering, is it possible that one of these areas may lead to a nonconformance? Well, uh, it is obviously conceivable uh, that an auditor might find a disconnect between an implemented process and an applicable statutory or regulatory requirement. Um, but whether it turns into a nonconformance is going to require a little bit of considered discretion. Uh, we're going to look at is this impacting customer satisfaction, a customer requirement, uh, the attainment of a quality objective, is it impeding your ability to manufacture your product or render your service? These are key considerations. Um, now, if a nonconformance is warranted, uh, obviously uh, the requirements cited need to include the appropriate clause from ISO 9001-2015. This is uh, an important piece of the puzzle when a nonconformance is written. So in conclusion, uh, we want to ensure that we are providing our clients with a value-added audit. Uh, and obviously, we want to meet all applicable requirements. Uh, we are definitely hopeful that the points of this presentation are going to help you uh, have a better understanding of our expectations for statutory and regulatory requirements. I would like to invite you to tune in for one of our other webinars, two that I'd like to highlight today. Uh, we have the interaction of processes and its importance to a successful audit. Uh, this is an exploration of processes and how to correctly understand them. Uh, we've also got a presentation on uh, exemptions. Uh, and what can and cannot be exempted in a quality management system. Uh, it is a, a good deep dive into how to approach the exemptions in your system. And obviously we've got webinars on a variety of other topics, stage one auditing, ISO 9001 itself, uh, IATF 16949 and so forth. The best way for you to be kept informed automatically is to opt in. And the way to do that is to visit our website at www.pjr.com. If you go to the bottom of the page, enter your email address and click subscribe, you'll be automatically opted in for updates on upcoming webinars and other points of interest uh, from PJR. I do thank you for your attention to my presentation today. I'm gonna go ahead and unlock the question portion of the dashboard. Okay, we have a question from uh, Mr. Ito. <clears throat> if the auditor finds that the customer does not comply with an electric system regulation, should the auditor issue an NCR? Uh, Mr. Ito, I assume you are asking if the auditor is finding that the auditee is not complying with the electric system regulation, should they issue an NCR? I'm going to say possibly. It's going to depend very much on. Uh, if that regulation is uh, applicable to the type of product and or service that they're rendering, if that is um, uh, an item that is uh, somehow rolled down or flowed down from the customer uh, and therefore is part of their system, part of their product or service. Data Treya Motker is asking um, about access to the slides and the webinar. Yes, uh, the slides are going to be available for download shortly after we're finished. And the webinar will be available for reviewing on our YouTube page. You'll find links for both of these um, on the pjr.com website. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Ito, seeing a, a clarification on your question, if the testing is for the production area, potentially yes. If if that's not being met, it could potentially be a nonconformance in the context of an audit. Any further questions today?
Okay. Thank you very much, everyone, for your attention. Have a great day.